I thought that it was a very interesting title for the conference, An Extraordinary Call. And clearly this is directing uh, us to the call to women, to various kinds of ministry, as being uh, rare, extraordinary, strange, untoward. You choose your own um, adjective of uh, as you prefer. But actually, I think it's just worth saying that for me, the extraordinary thing is that God should call anybody to do anything. Um, I mean, he could have got on so much better without us, couldn't he? <laughs> he, could have, he could have done it all. And it seems to me to speak volumes theologically that he is the sort of God who wants who truly wants and can use partners like us. And I think that's somehow to be kept at the back of our minds all the time when we begin to think about what in, in the end are smaller issues. I have taken um, inevitably, I suppose, a rather individual approach to this uh, paper, partly because as one of the first intake of women students and then women ministers, uh, I mean, not first uh, historically, but first when the, uh, when the ministry became open to women again in the beginning of the 1970s. As one of the first of those people, I suppose it's just of interest to describe uh, the experience as I had it. Uh, but you will... Um, it is my individual experience, and people are different, so there may well be people, uh, and particularly ordained women in the audience, who would want to say that their experience has been different, distinct, perhaps even contrary. That will all be part of our discussion, I'm sure. But I will tell it um, as best I can, as it has been for me. I'm sure that because of the relatively small number of women ministers at the beginning, I have had opportunities that might well not have come my way if I'd been male. My appointment to the staff at Queen's will certainly, I think, have been partly due to the need for a woman member of staff to reflect more accurately the gender balance of the student body. Now, I'm sure they weren't able to say that. It wasn't politically correct. But political correctness doesn't always seem to me to reflect the actual truth of the matter. And I saw nothing wrong with thinking, well, we must have some women on the staff uh, when the nearly half or perhaps even, no, probably nearly half in my time, the student body was female. There had been um, at least one member of staff on the, uh, at Queen's before I was appointed there. Uh, she, perhaps interestingly, was a pastoral, uh, tutor in pastoral matter matters. Uh, I was appointed to teach ethics on the rather slender uh, basis of having decades earlier uh, read some ethics as part of my undergraduate degree um, and also some New Testament. I was a classicist, which is very convenient for the New Testament because New Testament Greek is what is sometimes rudely referred to as daily mirror Greek. And if you can, uh, if you can, if you have done that, then the New Testament uh, doesn't present too many problems. Anyway, um, I think that the conference was um, also on the lookout for women as potential presidents. Uh, again, one doesn't say this, but I think, and I, I see nothing wrong with this, I think that gender balance is to be sought in leadership as early as may be, if you know what I mean, when uh, they, so many of our people are women, I would guess, in terms of Methodist membership, considerably over half. And then I think Methodists are a, a generous and inclusive people, and they regularly thought, well, oh, we should have a woman on such and such a committee. 
I think that was not just tokenism, and I took it quite kindly at one level, but it was also embarrassing because you had a sort of sense of being promoted beyond your pay grade. Uh, and that was particularly um, so, I think, when the committees were ecumenical and you had a whole lot of rather sort of high-flown male Anglican clerics and not an Anglican woman at that stage yet in sight. But, um, all right, you, you put up with that. Uh, and, of course, there were perks on being uh, positively discriminated uh, for whatever the word is. Um, for example, uh, I was sent on the, one of the delegation to go to the General Conference of the United Methodist Church in the United States in 1980 uh, because, well, they had, they were, it was very interesting really, they had four, four delegates. They had Kenneth Greet, the then Secretary of Conference, who I think was the person they really wanted. And then they had three approved minority representatives, as it were. They had um, a woman and they had a black and they had somebody from Northern Ireland. I mean, the, 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 the outposts, as it were. I, I think that was what it was. Maybe I'm just being cynical. Uh, anyway, the, the, uh, um, I, I'm really grateful to the fact that having been accepted as a woman minister, then I think the church on the whole has gone out of its way to provide opportunities for me. But perhaps I could be a bit more specific now and, and move to the, the topic for this conference, which is about preaching. Preaching was uh, an important element in my theological training. I think no one who trained at Wesley House in my time or earlier will forget sermon class, in which, and I'll tell you what sermon class was all about if you didn't have this experience, the student preached to the whole college in the chapel and the sermon was then commented on in strict order by a manner critic student, matter critic student, uh, how you said it and what you said, uh, any other student who wished to contribute, and then the staff in set order, beginning with the most junior and ending with the principal, who then pronounced the benediction and we all went home. <laughs> well, went to have coffee or whatever. And the student was not expected to say a word throughout this. Well, probably most of them were gibbering idiots by that time and didn't want to say a word, but uh, that, was, that was what it was. I'm not sure really how, quite how effective that was as a, a method of teaching you how to preach, but it undoubtedly left us in no doubt of the importance of preaching. And as to women students, a specific experience of this, uh, my one cherished memory really of my uh, student, well, was of our student organist choosing to play as his pre-service voluntary, thank heaven for little girls. <laughs> well, I rather think that the staff decided this, this fell into the category of things you pretend you haven't heard. Um, <laughs> By the time I was in my third year at Wesley House, preaching training was, was much less formal than that. And certainly by the time I was teaching at Queen's, it was entirely done on the basis of a sermon preached in a local church and listened to by one or two students plus a tutor with a debrief afterwards, which I think is a much more sensible way of doing it, really. Well, in circuit ministries moved to that, I have to confess that it was not really easy to give preaching its proper preparation time, given the multiple demands of ministry. They don't spend much time in theological training telling you about um, ministry as dealing with a country chapel which has no damp course, uh, nor indeed how best to handle administration uh, of any kind, which uh, it was a considerable burden at that time, and I'm quite sure has since got worse. So I had to keep reminding myself of how significant preaching was in terms of ministerial service offered. May I put it this way? If you spend an hour in preaching, you've, and you perhaps, you've, if you're lucky, um, perhaps an average congregation of 60, 
Well, obviously, some are much bigger, but some are much tinier. Um, you've done 60 person hours of ministry. If you do pastoral visiting, which I think is entirely uh, essential to, uh, to pastoral ministry, turkey ministry, it takes you a jolly long time to work, to work through 60 person hours of pastoral visiting. So it's, um, I think preaching is hugely important. And of course, this is, this is a comment not just uh, applicable to ordained preachers. Local preachers, after all, have many other things to do besides preach, uh, as well as ordained ones. And if they spend a long time in a circuit, they may well know local congregations very well indeed. Uh, my sister spent a long time in the Winchester circuit, and by the time she'd got to her 63rd time of visiting King Somborn, I think she was rather sort of strained as to whether, well, it, let's put it this way, she had to write some new sermons, certainly. Um, but, I mean, my primary point is that being entrusted with preaching the word of God is an amazing honour. I mean, what do we think we're doing? standing up and speaking for God. So it, at the very least, needs all the preparation we can give it. And now, rather belatedly, to the subject of call. What was extraordinary about the call in my case? Well, if I talk now mostly about uh, ordained ministry, that's because when I began, at least, women ministers were a good deal more rare than women local preachers. And I was conscious that my call was extraordinary, uh, both in other people's eyes and in my own, but not for the same reasons. For me, um, being a woman was actually nothing particularly amazing. Uh, I shared that characteristic, after all, with half the human race. What was extraordinary was the call to be a minister. By contrast, most other people saw nothing very extraordinary about ministers. Well, I mean, some of them may have been rather strange, but you know what I mean. Um, ministers they knew more or less about, but the idea of a woman being a minister was unfamiliar, to say the least. I always wore a dog collar when I was working because I think that visual signals about who one is are useful, and it stopped me having to explain myself um, quite so much. And when I was walking around the patch, I used to have the slightly unnerving experience of being looked at just beneath the chin. Well, I mean, most people, if they look at you um, at all, look you in the face, but you would get looked at just beneath the chin, and you could see that people were thinking, is that really a dog collar that I'm seeing? Well, that was the adult. Children were more straightforward. And they said, cool, are you a vicar? To which my usual response was, well, more or less. <laughs> well, that was for non-churchgoers, for whom a woman in a dog collar was of perhaps mild interest, but no more than mild. But for one's own people and for one's ecumenical colleagues, it was, of course, a different matter. The unfamiliar, on the whole, is treated with reserve. Against that, Methodists, I think, as I've said, are in general a kind and accepting people. And my own experience, and I'm very conscious that this is my experience, and others may not have been so lucky, but my experience was that people often went out of their way to make women ministers feel included. And yet, however kind people are, being in a small minority, as we were, is not restful. You are different, and therefore too obvious. At the inspired suggestion of Brian Beck, who was a tutor at Wesley House um, while the first women were training there, we went on a periodic retreat with the Roman Catholic Sisters of the Assumption, who used to be at Hengrave. And suddenly, one was in a place where it was normal to be female, and it was bliss. But more important than the mild discomforts of being in a minority, was the question of whether people were prepared to accept the ministry of ordained women. Because you cannot, with perhaps very rare exceptions, you cannot minister to people who do not want to be ministered to. 
And I remember my, still my pleasure mixed um, with relief when someone said after one of my first funerals, well, you're, you can see me out any time. So, and the even greater reassurance of one of my stewards saying a few months into my first appointment, we wondered what having a woman would be like, I mean, a woman minister would be like, but it's just the same really. Now, of course, not everybody felt that, probably, because you never know who's staying away, do you? Um, but I was not conscious of a significant problem within the Methodist Church, um, uh, because just by being uh, female as a minister. But I am aware that, as I say, that not all of my women colleagues would be able to say the same. And even for myself, I think it would be fair to say that one or two of my ministerial colleagues, and perhaps their wives, were not wholly at ease with me at the beginning, and that one or two, um, as I say, the wives joined in that sort of suspicion. But on the whole, I was not conscious of that reaction lasting long. One or two ecumenical colleagues, I think, had more... Uh, deep-seated issues with women ministers, though as some of them would never have accepted Methodist orders anyway, uh, that probably didn't make too much difference in practice. And only very rarely did I feel hurtfully discriminated against. And I think on the rare occasions that happened, that was probably good, because it did give me the really very dispiriting um, a negative experience of being discriminated against just for being something that I was. And of course that's true whether it's what gender you are or what race you are or what sexual orientation you are. And you find yourself saying, but it's not my fault that I'm a woman or black or whatever it is. And then say, hey, I, what am I doing sounding apologetic about who I am? Uh, and that's not a good place to be. But let me just go back now to my steward's conclusion that it's just the same, really, having a woman minister. Is it really just the same? And if it is, should it be just the same? Well, I think in the 70s and 80s, which is um, the period I've been asked to talk about principally, uh, when ordained women were quite unusual, we did certainly... Uh, tend to downplay differences and go for the just the same really option. One, one of the tutors at Wesley House said, we're going to treat you just like the men, and took it for granted that he was paying us a compliment. Well, we thought, um, well, let them get used to us first, and if we want to complain later um, about being treated as something that we're not, uh, we'll do it then. Now, said tutor um, was a dear man, and I'm honoured to say that he became a, a, a great friend in later life. Uh, and of course, it was in the days uh, before political correctness, and certainly feminist theology, I think, had not become at all mainstream. But nevertheless, um, being an honorary male was not what we were or felt. I still remember putting on the first clerical shirt that did up what, for me, was the right way. Because at the beginning, of course, you couldn't buy them because there, were, there wasn't enough market until the Anglicans came along. And when they did, um, then I could buy one that did up the right way. And I put it on and I heard myself say, and I think I said it out loud, Gosh, I feel human. And I was interested. I didn't, mean, I didn't say or think I've, I feel feminine. I thought I just feel human, a human being being recognised for the gender that she was because gender is such an enormously important part of our humanity. Uh, so I think that I, the thing I want to say last is that for a number of reasons... I think that the ordained ministry is more complete if it includes women presbyters than if it doesn't. And that's not just because I think women who are 
debarred from ministry because of their gender or ill-treated in, within ministry because of their gender are being treated unjustly. I think there's an importance about it for the church. And there must be a theological importance, mustn't there, about uh, having women ministers in the sense that it allows the whole human race and not just half of it, to be represented in a significant part of the ministry of the whole church. And of course, it avoids a dissonance between the church's membership as a whole, considerably more female than male, I guess, and an entirely male ordained leadership. Symbolically, in other words, it seems to me really quite important that the upfront person should sometimes be a woman. Pastorally, and you may want to come back about this, though men may be quite as gifted as women, and I've been fortunate uh, to know some really extraordinarily good pastors as men, including my own father, I may say. Um, but I think possibly men have are at a slight disadvantage in some pastoral contacts, uh, particularly in the matter of physical contact with women. If I were visiting a bereaved man, I think I could go and sit by him and put my hand on his arm without um, him feeling or my feeling that this was somehow me trying to seduce him. Whereas I think possibly um, men might have greater reason to be chary of any physical contact. And in the leadership of churches, too, I think there is uh, tends to be a difference in style between men and women, so that until you include women, maybe you lack something of completeness in that uh, leadership style. I guess more men than women are primarily at ease with a lead from the front role, now you'll immediately, I'm sure, be thinking of all sorts of women who are extremely good from leading from the front, and I could certainly name some. Um, but I think that there is somewhere, I guess, in women's experience, a sort of more nurturing, keeping the family happy, really, um, experience that somehow uh, comes out in the way that they uh, lead churches. Probably makes for longer meetings, which of course nobody wants. Everybody wants to have their say, but nobody wants to be there a long time, which two things of course don't really um, go together terribly well. And I think probably uh, the uh, if there is a female tendency, it's to let people go on talking too long. Uh, anyway, yeah, you come back on that too. But in all these matters, it, gender is only one factor. Uh, there's one ministers, after all, with the whole person that one is. And personality is a highly complex matter. My primary concern that the ministry should be open to women as well as to men lies in my conviction that everyone who has something to offer to ordained ministry should be able to make that offer. The church needs that, and I truly believe God wants it. <laughs>